I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. We'll sing that once again. If you notice, we don't have a piano player. Patty's brother's in, in town, and they went to Houston, and Lori ended up sick last night, so... She's out this morning, so we're doing this a cappella. So bring your singing voices. Let's stand as we sing that one more time. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. My soul rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your Our scripture reading today is going to come from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are from before his throne. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Let's pray together. We love you, Lord, and we do lift our voices, we lift our hearts, we lift our souls, we lift ourselves to you to say we love you and we wish to serve you. We're praying this day that we catch a new picture of you, that we truly realize or begin to realize at least just how wonderful, how powerful, how awesome, how majestic you are. That as we stop and think about these words we read this morning, that you have made us a kingdom of priests. You've washed us in your own blood. You've done everything to make us into something we could never be on our own. For this we praise you. And so as we worship you this morning, Lord, it may feel imperfect. It may feel we might be missing something. Lord, let our hearts shine through. Let us give our strength and our mind and everything we've got to worshiping you this morning. And God, speak, move, tell us, guide us, be very real to us. And if there's anyone here that's never known you as their personal Savior, today would be the day. Today would be the day they realize, they understand, and they start to believe that you, Jesus, died on that cross and rose from the grave so that we could all become the children of God. We say these things in the name above all names, the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. We are glad you're here with us today. Um, yeah, it's, let me see, we, we lost an hour of sleep, the air conditioner's not working right, and we can't find the piano players. It's just one of those days. But the Lord shows up, and so did you, so here we are. And uh, we pray that everything goes, uh, that just God speaks to us this morning. Sometimes, you remember Christmas Eve, wasn't that a real good service when we were freezing to death in here? And uh, how much fun that was. So today will be just like on the other end of the spectrum maybe. All right? Um, do want to remind you, we got a few things going on uh, this afternoon at 5.30 p.m. in the fellowship. 
uh, Johnny and Luisa Garcia. This will be their uh, last time with us. We're going to have a reception for them. Uh, they're moving to Uvalde this week. And so we want to uh, have a time to bless them, to pray for them, and uh, to let them know how much we love them. So you be sure if you can make it tonight, 5.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. There's refreshments. And uh, I know we're going to start on time because it's already set up. Wow. All right. So come and join us in the Fellowship Hall uh, this evening, 5.30. Right after that, at 6.30, we'll be going into our next session of Can I Ask You a Question? about sharing our faith more comfortably. So uh, just stick around for that. You've already had your punch and cookies, so there's really no reason to leave after that, right? So come and join us uh, this evening. That'll be at 6.30. Um, and uh, Finance Committee, I believe they're meeting today. This is spring break week here in Corpus Christi. You know what that means. There's about three times the traffic on SPID and down on the island. Um, there's a whole bunch of people in town. We've got several ministries like the Baptist Student Ministries going around trying to reach the spring breakers who've come in. So just pray. Pray for the first responders. Pray for the traffic. Pray that we don't have any foolish deaths this year. Um, and just pray that, that uh, maybe there's a few people that will come to know Christ during this time. All right? And so please uh, be aware of all that. Um, so because it's spring break, we don't have a WANA on Wednesday and we won't have the adult prayer meeting Bible study on Wednesday. They'll come back next week, but not this week. Okay. And uh, so keeping those things in mind, men, we have a breakfast coming up on Saturday, the 25th. Uh, we're having a men's prayer breakfast Saturday morning, 830 on March 25th. You're all you guys are invited. And whether you're a regular attender here or not. Um, we're going to have breakfast. We're going to have a time of just praying for our city, praying for our church, and uh, hope that you can come and join us for that. We will begin at 8.30, and uh, the announcement is in the messenger, the newsletter out on the little table out there, and there'll be room for it in next week's uh, bulletin also. So we will look forward to having you, okay, men, the 25th. Uh, a week from tomorrow, on the 20th, we will have our next vacation Bible school meeting on March the 20th and uh, so please if you can help with that uh, let us know please be there and uh, looking forward to that all right this is our bulletin and we got a little flap here and on this flap if you are with us for the first time or the first time in a long time we would greatly appreciate you filling this little form out and drop it in the offering plate when it passes by. We can get more information to you about our church. We would love to be able to do that. Um, you can uh, drop it in the offering plate later. At the end of the service, there, we have a little table in the foyer where there'll be coffee and refreshments. Um, if you don't get a chance to drop it in the offering plate, maybe you can drop it off at that table. We would greatly appreciate it, okay? And let's take a few moments now to go around and welcome one another into the Lord's house.
<laughs> Russell, there's there's always afterwards. <laughs> As we make it back to our places. That's another thing about not having a piano player because, you know, usually when the music stops, people know that it's time to go back. When there's no music playing, you don't know to go, or music stopping, you don't know to go back. <laughs> so if everybody would make it back to their places, we will be standing as we sing more precious than silver. Run, Alicia, run. <laughs> Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you And nothing I desire compares with you. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares with you. At this time, the children may be excused to head up to Children's Church. As they head out, the rest of us will sing Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, a little prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as gold don't think me poor or deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound, I'm 
just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Amen. Please be seated. This is our family prayer time where we take a moment to pray. The altar up here is open if you wish to come up here and pray. And uh, uh, we have a lot of needs among us. As we said, the Garcias will be uh, transferring to Uvalde. Then we have others that are struggling with health issues and finance issues. And you yourself, whatever you're going through. Many of us, um, as we said, are very concerned this time of year. There's always a lot of... Um, well, let's face it, DWIs and other things running around the city during the weeks of spring break. So let's be in prayer that people will be careful and that we'll be careful out there. Also, uh, remember to pray for all those souls. Um, there are ministries like the Baptist Student Ministries out there trying to reach out to them and pray that God will bless them greatly. We're going to bow our heads. And if you would like to come up here to the front, you may. Uh, deacons, if you would stand up, please. And if you would like someone to pray with you, um, just raise your hand and one of our deacons will come by and pray with you. Or you could come up here uh, at the altar and uh, our deacon, uh, Ralph Cariaga, will pray with you. So let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord. Our Lord and our God. We sing a song close to Christmas called Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence and with fear and trembling stand. It tells the story of being in the presence of Jesus, that babe in the manger, to realize that God has taken on human flesh and come among us. And at other times throughout time where you come among us to save us, to bless us, to judge us. Remind us, Lord, that sometimes the quiet is so valuable for hearing you. That we come to you, Lord, broken, concerned, struggling, feeling a whole range of emotions, Lord worried about our immediate future, our children, our grandchildren, our schools, worried about our city, worried about our country. But then we realize what a great Father we have. That you've told us to cast all our care upon you because you care for us. So these anxieties, this feeling of dread, this slight bit of panic that's deep down in our stomach, we give that to you. We truly are ignorant of where enough money will come from, whether a new job will open up, whether we can pass this class or not. We come to you, Lord, concerned for that diagnosis, wondering what the test results will show. Some of us, Lord, are in a, bit, a little bit of fear right now just over what, what just might or might not happen. So we come to you with our hearts trembling and saying to you, God, I need you. Would you come down 
and render mercy? Would you come down and show your power? Would you come down and fulfill your promises? Would you come down and reach into our hearts and change us? Give us courage. Give us strength. Help us to trust you. Remind us why we do. Lord, we want to see you glorified. We want to see answers to our prayers. <coughs> but most of all, we want to see you high and lifted up. Let us never think that we deserve these answers. Let us never, never think that we deserve your help. You do it by grace and by mercy. And for that, Lord, we beg and ask, please, have mercy, have grace, and be mighty. This church, Lord, needs to reach this community. Open up doors of opportunity for us. Give those of us who've been studying, can I ask you a question, the remembrance and the, the wisdom to know, here's a chance to ask the two questions. Here's a chance to share the two Bible verses. Here's our chance, Lord. Keep us sensitive to these things, Father. We have Vacation Bible School coming up. We have First Blessing Shoe Giveaway coming up in the summer. Even now, Lord, prepare us. Help us. Lord, in a few weeks, we celebrate your resurrection. We pray that we'll be ready. We pray that we'll reach out to those around us. God, that it'll be a weekend of many salvations, many restorations, many people finding hope again. Why? Because Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. So, Lord, we pray for all that's going on. We pray for our government leaders. We pray for their wisdom. We pray for those who are protecting us. We pray your hand upon them. We pray, God, for every person in this room. You know their hearts. You know their needs. Reach down, Lord. Let us leave this building today different. Different than when we came in. That we've been changed by the power of the Lord. That we've been enlightened. We've been encouraged. We've been empowered by the Lord. Lord, today speak, move, and be mighty for us. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Join me in singing Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the shadows o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find. Rest beyond the river near the cross.
us all watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand, just beyond the Let's go ahead and stand for our offering. And we'll sing, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of us shall gather to on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine that warms the earth, helps plants grow. Thank you for the opportunity and the freedom that we have to gather in this place openly, publicly, and profess your love. We thank you for each and every soul that's here, Lord. And I pray that they know you before they walk out of this building if they don't. I pray that we are able to extend the hand of fellowship and that they feel like they're part of the family. I thank you for this time that we have to worship by giving back to you just a portion of what you have blessed us with, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you take these tithes and offerings and multiply them in only ways that you can. Not only that we are able to sustain this building and this location, that we are able to reach out into the community, into the city, into the state, that people may turn towards you, Lord. And I ask that you continue to guide us and forgive us when we sin against you. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, 
We are glad you're here with us today and bearing with us through all the little challenges we've got. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, we will be in verses 18 to 20. And uh, talking on the topic of the preeminence of Christ. We're in a series here on Colossians about Jesus the missing piece. Colossians talks a lot. Uh, about Christ and who he is and what he has done and the reason is is because they're in a world there where the society has decided to start preaching a different Christ a Christ who is not strong a Christ who is just basically a ghost of that guy who died on the cross that he, he's not in fact someone true and and divine but just as a glorified human in a sense uh, much like a superhero, I guess we would say. But most of all, uh, in doing so, they turn people away from Jesus. And you will find this true. If you want to identify whether something is a cult or not, just look at what they teach about Jesus. If they teach anything short of what we see here in Colossians chapter 1, uh, yeah, they're not teaching the true doctrine. They are a cult. They are a false religion. And in this day of tolerance, um, we're supposed to just love everybody, and we do, but that doesn't mean we're going to go along with what they're saying, okay? So, we're going to read Colossians in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Would you stand, please, if you're able to, for the reading of God's Word? Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, and by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this time for the way you reach down to us and listen to us. And here today, Lord, we stand before you, your people, ready to hear from you, wondering, Lord, what direction we should take, where we should go. We ask you, Father, all these things, guide us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. And um, yeah, we live in a world that wants a Jesus that is tamed, a Jesus that is fitting into their presuppositions, a Jesus that is not demanding. Yes, he loves everyone and tolerates their sin to whatever level. And most of all, he never really makes a demand that you change. But we come to the New Testament, we come to God's Word, and we see this is not the Jesus that is proclaimed here. We've been reading in Colossians chapter 1 the last several Sundays, and we've talked about him being equal with the Father, the exact image of his Father. We've talked about him being the creator, that yes, all things are made by him, and, and remember that little preposition for him, that it's not all up to you. It was, it's his creation, and you belong to him too. And we come now, and it says that we're using the word preeminent. That's a big word that means uh, surpassing all others. That he is, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is above all the others. Our God is more than they could be imagined. We can't just say Jesus is number one. Because in truth, number two is so far below him, it really shouldn't be number two. He is so far above and beyond. We can't just say he's the best. The, the, the words fail us to describe the exalted state of Jesus Christ. Uh, when we mention that uh, he was creator last week in there, it said that uh, all things were made by him and for him, and he's before all things. And we mention that he's not just before in terms of time, that he was there at creation. He's eternal. He's also before all things in authority. And what we could say is preeminence. That means there is none greater. None has a greater say. None has a greater power. None has greater ability than Jesus Christ. That name above all names. That throne above all thrones. That Lord of lords and King of kings. His preeminence is well expressed here. And we begin by looking at it and understanding what this means for you and me. 
Him being preeminent, him being awesome, just doesn't mean he's out there, but also that he's in here among us. Let's take a look then at the passage. Verse 18, and he is head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. So let's think then. In one sense, calling him the head makes him what we would call an organic head, like the head of the body, like my head. It's my head that gives me life and growth. My head controls so many things, the hormones and all of that that flows through our body. It determines and determines our body functions. The brain powers my systems, my digestive system, my circulatory system, my nervous system. My brain powers the muscular system. How? Because it's always sending out the signals to each and every point in my body what to do. He keeps us going too, doesn't he? He is as the head of this church. Oh yes, we got a pastor, we got committees, we got deacons, we even got a business meeting coming up in April. But who runs this church? It better be Jesus. It needs to be Jesus. We need to have our hearts submitted to him in such a way that we are always seeking his will and not ours. Because he's the head of this church. Not just to this local visible body, but also across the globe. He is our source of life and growth. But also, he's not just that source, that organic head. He's also ruling head. Where do all my decisions get made? Up here. Where do I make my choices at? I base it up here, right? It all starts there. For our church, where are those decisions starting? Who are we deciding to follow? It starts with turning to our head and letting the head rule. So in that sense then, Jesus as our ruling head, he guides and decides where this church is going. He does all the brain work for us. We seek His will. We seek to do it His way. We pray and we submit to Him so that we can follow Him, both as individuals and then as the group here. We must submit to Him. Why? Because He's the only one who can guide us in the right way. I can come up with the best I think we ought to do, and you can come up with the best you think we ought to do, but only one can come up with what's best for us. We often don't see the consequences and the fallout of our decisions and our actions. Here is Jesus trying to lead us, trying to guide us. Here is the Holy Spirit giving us impressions, giving us circumstances, giving us the Word and all these things to help us decide. And yet we choose to just go with our own feelings. We choose to go with our own, I like the blue better than the red. I like the left better than the right. I like the up better than the down. We choose our decisions and we wonder why it doesn't work out. As a church, what unites us is the fact that we're listening to the head. Well, he's the pastor. Do I have soul contact with him? No. I love the Lord, but I hope you do too. As such, each and every one of us ought to be in touch with him. Now, there may be him telling you that you fill this part of the body and you fill that part of the body... You're a foot, you're a knee, you're a hand, you're an elbow. In that sense, he leads us a little bit different, but it's still his body, and he wants us working in that one direction. And that only comes when we realize that the ultimate one to decide what we're going to do here is Christ. And this is why we ought to always put a big emphasis on prayer, not just in our services, but in our life, so that we can be in touch with the head. Be sure that we're listening to him. Because the more we talk, the more we learn it's His voice. The more we speak to Him, the better we learn to determine His voice out of all the others out there. And so we learn very at the very first that Jesus, when we say He's preeminent, He's the head. He's the source of life and growth. He's also the source of decisions and guidance. He's our head. And so we move on then and say, what else is He? He is the beginning and the firstborn. He is before all things. Well, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. All right. We've touched on him being the creator. We have touched on him being the firstborn in earlier passages. Firstborn is kind of a title. It doesn't just mean you're the oldest kid. 
It means you're the kid, you're the heir, you're the one who's going to inherit all of dad's stuff, all of dad's reputation, all of dad's authority. All the authority of the father and all the good that he has passes to the firstborn. He is also the beginning, as we saw. He was there at creation. We see in the book of Revelation that he is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Why is that? Because he is there always for all time. So we see then as being called the beginning and the firstborn that he is the creator in eternity as we spoke about last week. He is the source of creation, the agent of creation as we mentioned last week. But also as the resurrected heir of his father's throne, the firstborn. Notice earlier back when we covered back a few weeks ago we were in... Um, Verse 15, and we said he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation. So there's Jesus, the firstborn, having the authority as his father's heir over creation. Now look at verse 18. And he is the firstborn from the dead. Isn't that interesting? This Jesus who came down from heaven, who's the exact image of his father, who created the heavens and the earth. This Jesus took on human flesh and was crucified upon that cross. And when he rose from the grave, he becomes what's called the firstborn from the dead. Just like he's the heir of all things with creation, he also is by overcoming death. That resurrection of his. And he emptied, he came out of that tomb on the third day. The reason we celebrate Easter, the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In so doing, we always remember that he conquered death. He is the firstborn of the resurrection. You and I, how do we know we're going to live forever? How do we know in Christ we conquer death? Because our Savior, who is as dead as dead could be on that cross, war experienced battle scarred soldiers, ran a spear up through his ribs to make sure he was dead. When they took him down the cross, they said, this guy's dead. He's so dead, bled out, brutalized, there's no way if he was alive, he could impress anybody as being a survivor. Jesus was dead when they put him in that tomb. And when they came out on Sunday to anoint him and finish up preparing him for the burial that they ran out of time for on the Sabbath on Friday, they find out that stone that was guarded by Roman soldiers had been abandoned. That stone rolled away. The soldier's gone and the tomb empty. And then the angels came to say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen as he said. He is the firstborn of the resurrected. And because he did that, there's your promise that you will also. That tomb will not hold you either. We will not just be dead and buried. You will live forever with him. And there will come the day when we receive that resurrected body that is not like this body, but it is immortal and incorruptible. And it will never be sick. It will never feel sadness or sickness. This is the resurrection he promises to you. And he says, I'm the firstborn. I'm the first one in line for that. And I'm the one who's providing that inheritance. That inheritance of a resurrection for all of us. Because see, we see this earlier in Colossians 2, that we are heirs with him. See, we're in that will. We receive also. We're not near the equal of Jesus. But we have an equal share in what the Father's leaving. What the Father is giving. As firstborn of the resurrection... He is heir to that throne. And he is also saying, you all come with me. Because the firstborn is also the sign of better things to come. So here he is, our Jesus on that throne, resurrected. When we get to the book of Revelation, and he is seen upon that throne, how is he seen? He is seen as a lamb that was slain. He still looks like he got killed on that cross to remind each of us that that is our Lord and our Savior up there. That we know without a doubt that is the Christ who died for you and who died for me. That he rose from that grave and sits on that throne full of mercy and power. 
There He is. Why is He preeminent? He's the head of our church. He's the firstborn in the beginning. But also, looking at verse 19, He is preeminent because He possesses the fullness. What do we mean? Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. What fullness? What fullness could he possibly be talking about? That's just one of them words. I really wish he defined it a little better. The best we can say in this case is that the fullness is, number one, all that the Father is. Everything that God is, the fullness that is God the Father Almighty, is also Jesus Christ the Son. He is not God Junior. He is not God Second Class. <coughs> he is everything that His Father is. He is also everything that His Father does. We mentioned last week, when the Father is creating, what was the Son doing? He was creating. When the Father is seeking and saving that which is lost, what is the Son doing? He's seeking and saving that which is lost. Whatever the Father is doing, the Son is doing. He can do all the works of His Father. He can do all the creating. He can say the word and things happen. Don't you remember? He calmed storms. He made the blind to see. He made the, the crippled to walk. And He didn't do it with a big show. He just simply said it and it happened. Just like in Genesis chapter 1. Let there be light and there was light. That is the power of the Son. That is the fullness of the Father. That He is all that the Father is. That He is all that the Father does. And this fullness dwells in Him. So that when you see Christ, you're seeing the Father. John 1.14, we've read it before. We beheld His glory. The glory as of what? The only begotten of the Father. No man has seen God. But we've seen Jesus. And we've got Him. So here he is, this Christ, who is more than you and I could ever imagine. And, and in light of all that now, that he's, as we've gone through this chapter 1, how great he is that, that he has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. We have redemption through him, the forgiveness of sins. He's the image of his Father. He's created all things by him, through him, for him. And he is before all things. And he's the head. And he's the firstborn. And in all the fullness dwells in him. And it all sums it up here in verse 20 then to tell us, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So see, all that sums up to say, because of this, he is able to reconcile. A world that has rebelled against God. A world that wants to water him down and silence his followers. A world that wants to say, never mind what the word of God has always taught. Let's decide in these modern times, we know better. God created a man and woman, we know better now. God created marriage for one man and one woman, we know better now. God did this, God said, you know, keep yourselves pure, walk holy, we know better now. Let's abandon all that. And here we stand and we look at Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we say, no, we can't change any of that. He established it. He created it. We need to follow it. In a world that wants to deny Him and, and to rebel against Him, He came to reconcile it to Himself. Not on the world's terms, but on His terms. Why does Jesus get to make all the rules? Why does He get to tell us what to do? Well, A, He's God. B, He's God. And C, He's God. He created us. He died for us. He opened the gate to heaven for us. He's offered everything. And in our mind, all we can think, because we are sinful human beings, and this is all we've ever experienced, all, when we think of somebody else being in charge, all we think of is, they hold me down. They hold me back. They oppress us. They tell us what to do. We cannot conceive of someone having authority over us that loves us absolutely and is always seeking our best. 
because I keep thinking what I want is for my best and how often is what I want my downfall? How often is what I want the collapse of everything good around me? But instead, here comes the Lord saying, trust me. I really do know what's best. Sometimes what best hurts a little bit. Sometimes what's best is a struggle. But I came to tell you with all that rebellion against me, with all that struggle against me, to reconcile. It means I'm ready to tear down that wall that you've built up between us. The Lord says that wall of sin that each of us has built up, that wall of rebellion, that wall of wanting to do our own thing, that wall of wanting to fit in with modern society. And, and God says, look, my preeminent son is here to tear that wall down, to reconcile all things to himself. We are separated by our sin. We are missing out on the blessing of having him in our life. We are missing out on having this preeminent one being able to lead and guide and help us to find purpose and find the security and love that we've always wanted. We've looked in every relationship. We've looked in every bottle and in every needle and we still can't find something that gives us peace. And here he comes to reconcile us to himself. Reconcile simply means to move out all that bad blood. To get away rid of the differences. To get rid of that separation. In our case, to get rid of that sin that has separated us from Him. How did He do this? He wants to reconcile all things to Himself. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. Don't you love it? It's not just about me and you, but it's all of creation. He wants to bring back together the heavenly bodies, the earthly bodies. He wants to bring back all of nature. He wants to bring it all and reconcile all of it back to himself. Just like the Garden of Eden was meant to be. And here he comes offering this for you. And he did this, making this peace through his blood on the cross. That this one who is so powerful, this one who is your creator, this one who is so able to flick you across the universe into destruction is saying to you, I thought you were important enough to come down and die for you. To bleed out. Suffering a humiliating death. With the sin of the world, the guilt of the world laid upon him. He hung upon that cross for you and for me. That's how he reconciled us. The only way to remove the barrier between us was to pay for it. To suffer the consequences of it, the judgment of it. And that suffering Jesus did on the cross was the suffering for you and me. Yes, this preeminent one, this creator, this firstborn, this beginning and the end, this guy, he's the one who would empty himself of all that deserved glory and die like a sinner upon a cross, becoming sin for us, that the guilt of all the world of all time laid upon him, experiencing that, that dreaded moment of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Watching them gamble for his clothes. In all of that, he hung there and then died. And then, as we said, the firstborn of the resurrection. That the victory is done. We are reconciled if you'll have it. The peace with God comes on his terms, not yours, not mine. Okay, God, if you'll give in a little bit on this and a little bit on that, I think we can come to an agreement. No, 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 no. God said, here it is. Believe. And you'll have it all. Turn from your old life. I don't want that anymore. Instead, I want Christ. I want Christ all alone. I want Christ by and none other. And then, in that moment, that you call upon him and say, I believe in you, Christ. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died on that cross. I believe you rose from the grave. If that's coming from the heart, if you're saying to him, I need a new start, Lord. Yes, right here, right now, reconciled. In that moment. Reconciliation is that big work where God removes the intimacy between us and Him. And it's done by Christ on that cross and that empty grave. 
It's done by the one who created you. It's done by the one who has all power over you. And yet he gives you the choice. He gives you the moment that you can come and say, yes, Lord. He has moved all of heaven and earth literally to get this message to you. To get this invitation to you. He has done all that he possibly can. And now it comes to you and me. Do you believe? Are you ready for this? Is this the Jesus you want to have? So often, we don't want him to have authority over us. But as we're seeing in Colossians here, every bit of power, every bit of government power, every bit of physical power, every bit of political power, every bit of authority that's out there, he's over it. And he can reconcile all of it. We can kick against him and we can fight back and we can struggle all our life. But you know, peace is only going to be found when we surrender to this preeminent one. When we surrender to Christ and say to him, I surrender all. Wherever you lead, I'll follow. When we're ready to say, I'm giving up all of my pride, all of my abilities, all of my attitude. I want to turn from that, Lord, and I want to grab onto you. I want to find that peace that passes all understanding. I want to find what it's like to not fight with God anymore. I want to find what it's like not to fight with myself anymore. I want to find what it's like to be at peace because now that missing peace that I've been missing all this time, that's Jesus. I always doubted he could do it, but today I found out he's got all the fullness of the Godhead. He's more than able to change your heart. In a moment, we're going to sing a song. And while we're singing, maybe you're ready to say, hey, I, I want you to pray with me because I'm ready for change. I'm ready for something to happen here. I'm ready to not just keep going on and doing the same old, same old. Today is the day I want a new start. While we're singing, I want you to come down and let me pray with you. Maybe you're one that's ready to say, I'm a believer and I'm ready to follow the Lord in baptism or in joining this church. Then, then you come also. But first we want to pray. And maybe you're ready to ask Christ into your life. While we're praying, this is a great opportunity to do that. Strike while the iron's hot. If he's speaking to your heart today, I encourage you to open yourself up to him. Let's bow ourselves, our heads and let's pray. Our Lord and our God, you're so kind, merciful. You're so good. My life's been a struggle, Lord, and sometimes I wonder what good is, but, but now I'm finding it in you. I'm understanding how much you loved us and to what extent you'd go to. So we ask you this day, Lord, to speak to each heart here. And there's some of us that feel a little uncomfortable, like you're, something's happening and we're not sure what it is. Help them to understand that that's you speaking to them, maybe for the first time in their life. Help them to understand that today is the day they can surrender to you. Their creator, the firstborn, the beginning, the one who holds it all in his hands, right here, right now, is speaking to the, each one. Lord, help us to answer. Help someone to pray and say, yes, Lord, I believe, and I want to follow you. And I want to leave my old life behind, and I want a new life with you, Jesus. Right here, right now, saying that, Lord, you can give them a new start. Give them that assurance. Give them that confidence that, yes, you were listening. And you heard. And you told us, whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Right here, right now, they began to believe. And they shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for each one here that you have spoken to our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. We're going to sing now. And as we sing, perhaps you would like to come. Come to this altar or maybe have me pray with you. Uh, in, in whatever need you're feeling, we invite you to come. So let's all stand. And as we sing, you're invited. Take that step. Let the Lord know, yes, I am ready. And to show you I'm ready, Lord, I'm going to step out. I'm going to go down. I'm going to pray with the pastor. Today is that day. 
take that step. As we sing, would you come? Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. So Sing it through one more time and let's let this be our prayer. And I am saying to you, Lord, truly wherever you lead, I'll go. I really am trying to find your will. I really am trying to find where you want to take me. Wherever you lead, I'll go. Is that your prayer today? Thank you all so much for being here today. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you moving back? Yep. Oh, we're back. We're back. You moved in and everything? Yep. Wow. All right. Well, you the, accept my letter? Yeah. Did you ever move it? You weren't supposed <laughs> I don't know. to. I they, don't think okay. I did. Okay. <laughs> this is Russell and Tricia Smith. For those of you that don't know, he started going here when he was like nine years old. And uh, uh, further back than that. Oh, okay. Travis. Four yeah. Five, um, the Travis School. Back at the other side of town. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and uh, they moved to Houston several years ago due to her work, and she uh, is now independently wealthy and doesn't need to work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Get on her website, and she'll show you how. <laughs> uh, but they are back, uh, They and uh, so they're moving their membership back, and they'll be back with us, praise the Lord. Are you in favor of that? Amen? Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, we do, we do want to say as a couple, we, we are so proud of what y'all have done to keep the church going. It's difficult right now. Mm -hmm. all, there's churches closing all over the place, and y'all have fought and hung in there. And we really thank y'all for that. Amen. Because Amen. This, the church means a lot to us, to our family. Our grand, grandkids are fifth generation. <laughs> Sixth generation. Sixth generation. Yeah. <laughs> I, wasn't, I don't know that I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> but again, we want to thank y'all for hanging in there mm. and just being here and supporting. And uh, I think there's some great days coming. Amen. I really do. I think we're seeing a revival. Amen. All over the all over the country, you're starting to see things start kind of kicking in, and people are going. They can't trust anybody anymore. Okay, so they already had a sermon. Okay. <laughs> but again, all we right. thank you for we thank this guy. All right, thank you. Thank you. I know you're hungry. Yeah. You got to beat the Episcopalians. You got to beat the Episcopalians. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much. It's so good to have them back. He was, uh, were you on the pulpit committee? Uh, no. Were you? No. You were just were, around were a you? lot. I just had to vote for you. Okay. Um, uh, he was here when I first got here and was a good friend then and helped me through some spots and has always had a great spot. So I am grateful. I know they'll be a blessing to us. All right. And uh, again, 530 this afternoon, we're going to say goodbye to Johnny and Louisa for now. 
Um, we will see them in heaven at least. Um, I'm sure they'll want to come back to Corpus every weekend and make somebody drive them. So um, we're hoping that happens. And uh, uh, But do come and join us for that please today. And uh, Senior Adult Fellowship is Tuesday. I forgot to announce that this morning. But Senior Adult Fellowship Tuesday morning 930. And Elias de los Santos, would you come and dismiss us in prayer please, sir? Yes, you have to stay. Church, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You send us your Son, and you offer everlasting life through him. And we truly believe in that. Like you say in your word, dear Lord, if my people or humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And we, I will forgive your sins and heal your uh, land. Bring us rain, dear Lord. We need it. Thank you that you send us uh, your ordained son and that we abide in him and he will abide in us. We love you, Heavenly Father. We thank you. And again, use us, dear Lord, as your witnesses that we can spread the, good, uh, the gospel news that lead to uh, eternal life through your son. We love you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for everything that you do. And we thank you for this church that's been around for more than 110 years. And we ask you all these things through your mighty son, our Lord and Savior, and Redeemer that li uh, that's on your right side until you tell him to come. Amen.